Hello. Today I will talk about the Schieffen Plan. Uh, I will discuss its implementation in World War I in another video. The plan was devised by Alfred von Schieffen, the chief of the German Imperial General Staff from 1891 to 1906. A meticulous planner, Schlieffen devised a series of plans for what he foresaw as Germany's next war, and it was the final official version, the 49th, that was the one that bears his name. Even after his retirement, however, Schlieffen continued to fuss over the details of his plan. The basic assumption behind the plan was that ever since the Franco-Russian alliance was concluded in 1892, Germany faced the possibility of a two-front war against Russia in the east and France in the southwest. As the alliance guaranteed that the two powers would support each other in the event of war, Russia and France had to be regarded as Germany's joint main enemies, and Stephen's job was to ensure that Germany had a strategic plan that would ensure victory against two major powers. In the later versions of his plan, Schlieffen made the further assumption that at least for the present, Russia posed the weaker threat, and that therefore France, as the stronger of the two opponents, had to be dealt with first. This view was reinforced after Russia's defeat in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905. This scenario had the added advantage that a war with France would be more straightforward. Paris, the French capital, and other strategic French sites were not far from the German border, whereas the main Russian cities of St. Petersburg and Moscow lay across the vastness of the Russian plain. A quick victory against France was feasible, but any war with Russia was likely to be protracted, even though German strength would eventually prevail. Again, like Germany, France would be able to mobilize rapidly, presenting an immediate challenge to German force, whilst Russia was still economically backward and lacked effective means to move and concentrate its troops, so would be slow to build up its forces. The war with France would have to be immediate, but that with Russia would be both more protracted and less urgent. The plan would have to enable the Germans to rapidly defeat the French before turning to the lumbering giant to the east. Since the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, of course, the French had built up their armed forces and were well prepared to defend themselves against a direct attack from Germany. The French were a strong opponent, and a direct attack would be costly and difficult. Schlieffen therefore reasoned that the way to force the French into a quick defeat would be to launch a surprise attack on them from the north, over the Belgian border, rather than directly across the common Franco-German border, behind which were major French fortresses. To accomplish this, he proposed a massive flanking attack to be directed through Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands, small neutral countries with only limited military resources. Given Schlieffen's essentially technocratic approach to planning, the international ramifications of a German violation of the neutrality of these small states was not given much attention. Rather, what he and his officers did was to work out in detail the logistics of preparing a massive German army on the border and then moving it through a great arc, rather like a scythe cutting through the corn, or if you prefer, a door pivoting on its supports. Thus, whilst the far left wing of this force on the immediate Franco-German border would remain fixed, the far right would be required to advance rapidly through the Netherlands and Belgium to reach the Franco-Belgian border. This massive German army of the right and centre would then advance rapidly through northern France, outflanking the main concentration of French troops on the German border and taking Paris before swinging around to the east to destroy the French forces, which would now be trapped between the main bulk of the Germans and the small German force on the border. The French would quickly capitulate. Indeed, to ensure that the French army remained fatally stuck in the Franco-German borderlands whilst the main German army swung round and took Paris, Stephen proposed that the German forces on their common border could yield a small amount of German territory to the French, thus drawing them in. 
With France eliminated from the war and forced to make concessions to Germany, the main German forces would then be rapidly shipped across Germany by the country's excellent rail network to deal with the Russians, who had hitherto been held back by a smaller German force. The struggle with Russia would take much longer than that with France because of the sheer size of the country. It was over 800 kilometers from the East Prussian regional capital of Konigsberg, modern Kaliningrad, to St. Petersburg, and even further to Moscow. The greater size of the Russian army would not be a deciding factor. The German army was better organized and better equipped and would prevail. When a modified version of the Stephen Plan was used in the opening months of World War I, it notably failed, however, and there was later discussion as to whether it would have been successful if it had not been modified. My own view is that the Stephen Plan would have been likely to fail in either its original or in its modified form. The plan was bold and imaginative, but like many technocratic approaches to problems, it was conceptualized as a series of seemingly perfect controllable moves that worked on paper or at a theoretical level. Indeed, Schlieffen was so precise in his planning that a mere six weeks were allowed for the defeat of France following the commencement of the German invasion. Schlieffen neglected unpredictable scenarios that did not fit in with his plans. Would resistance by the armies of the small countries to which the German army passed make any difference to the plan? Would the French be able to respond adaptively to the German invasion and move their troops fast enough to block their advance? Even if Paris fell, would the French really capitulate? Again, political questions were not considered. What would be the international repercussions of a German invasion of small neutral countries? In particular, would it increase the chance of British involvement in an anti-German coalition? All of these factors were to prove important in the failure of the modified version of the Stephen Plan in World War I, and would also have been important if the unmodified version of the plan had been used. Moreover, Schlieffen underestimated the logistical difficulties of getting large masses of German troops moving through enemy territory with the technology then available. It was easy enough to prepare exact rail schedules for massive movements of troops and their supplies within Germany, but the situation on enemy roads and railways was significantly different and unpredictable. His plan required a higher level of communication and coordination than was then possible. This raises the wider issue of Stephen's neglect of Clausewitz's crucial concept of friction. For Clausewitz, human factors always had to be allowed for in war. These included human error, lack of information, and the soldier's exhaustion, sickness, poor morale and fear. All of these factors were multiplied as the size of the forces involved increased. Again, there was the fog of war, the prevalence of uncertainty, and the unexpected as soon as battle was joined. In these terms, Schlieffen's plan was fatally flawed. It assumed that the expected events and consequences of a complex plan would proceed without serious interruption, and there was no adequate contingency planning or alternatives envisaged in case the plan did not go according to schedule. Schlieffen naively assumed that strict adherence to the operational objectives and timetables that he had devised would carry Germany to overwhelming success. He was wrong. Thank you for listening.